My name is Michaela Glöckler and my profession is pediatrics. And before I did my medical training, I qualified as a Waldorf teacher. So my field is, and my lifelong concern, how to help children and young people to grow up healthily. So this field between education and medicine, that is my most favorite, and to do prevention. Yeah, for me is healthy childhood, prevention for the whole life that people later do not get ill. Because most of the diseases in the second half of life are coming from problems in childhood and youth. Yeah, so that's a bit my intention. So that is the question what role anthroposophy plays in my life. So for me it was important to understand the human being. If you work with medicine, education, you want to understand development, yeah, the conditions of healthy development. And this you don't learn in the modern academic training. It's very poor. You learn very little about health, about development. You learn a lot of facts, a lot of how to understand illness and symptomatic treatment and all these sort of things. And through anthroposophy, I learned all what I needed to understand really also the soul and spiritual development and not only physical facts uh, about how, to, how the body is changing throughout growing period or things like that. And therefore I'm grateful that my grandmother got to know Rudolf Steiner himself. She listened to his lectures and she was very interested in spiritual experiences because when her husband died in the First World War, in that moment of his death, he, she lost consciousness and fell down. And she was alone. And after a while, she woke up again. And she looked at her watch and felt something has happened with my husband. And when then, years later, the news came, I think one or two years later, that he will not come back, that he died. And it was told to her when it was exactly that moment. And this was for her the first spiritual experience. Yeah. And then she spoke about this with a friend and the friend says, I know someone who knows about such experiences come to this lecture and so she came to that and when then she heard that Rudolf Steiner opened a school she decided as a widow to take her two children to Stuttgart from Berlin and so she rented a house and took other children into this house so that they all could go to the world of school and she had a certain little income and so then later my father got to know, he became a world of teacher. After the Second World War, when he survived, he was journalist and always at the front to bring home the messages, to write the articles. And so when he survived after nine years war, he wanted completely to change his life. And so he decided to become a world of teacher and to work for life and not for death anymore. So, and I grew up and that is really the gift of my own development in a family who really lived a wonderful family culture. Good relationships, taking one another serious, no beating, no punishment, you know, just no aggression. It was just a human atmosphere and of course my parents were Christian, not Muslim, but we celebrated all these Christian festivals beautifully and I also learned not only, yeah, for me religion was not a certain confession, 
So I was very early interested in all the other religions as well and in my Waldorf school. In the last school year, in 12th grade, we learned the 12 major world religions and the main philosophy. So we really got overview of the spiritual development of humanity. And so that, that is my gratitude for this wisdom I was able to, to learn. Ja, Goethe was a cultural hero. He was extremely developed. He knew all famous people of his time. He was in correspondence with all the scientific persons and yeah, with the cultural creative elite of his time. And it's a huge volume what he wrote. He had a diary every day he wrote. You can follow his life from day to day. So it's, it's unbelievable. He was always busy and he said, I relax through one activity from the, the last one. So it just changed from art to writing to scientific observation. But his most favorite was to learn a way of thinking which is appropriate to understand life and to understand the evolution. So he wanted not theoretically to think about nature, like the Darwinists, for example, who then has a certain theory. He said theories are not life. Life itself is the best theory. When I understand life, then I have a theory which can cope with reality. So it, this was his way of thinking. And so he learned a new way of observing nature and he realized I understand and I see only properly what I really love. But when you love a plant, this is not human erotic sympathy, you know, it's a total other quality of love. It is true empathy with another being and his way of looking to plants, animals, to the weather, to the sun, he loved the sun, was, am I open enough to let the other live in my soul, live in my observation, live in my thoughts? Are my feelings pure enough that another person feels well? You know, these are high up questions, not normal questions, but that were his questions. And he wrote to this Charlotte von Stein, he loved platonically because she was married. He wrote her a love poem. And there is one line which was for me also a certain orientation for life particularly when I have to do with patients or with clients or with children, because he wrote her, I felt myself good in your eyes. So the way she looked at him made him feel good. So how do we need to look to children, to other people, that they feel good in our eyes. It's a beautiful reflection, yeah. And then what I shared yesterday, he started to do all his nature studies and so he did a lot of drawings and he sent it her lots of drawings, I think almost 300 altogether. But then one day she said I would prefer to receive another love poem and not all these drawings from a leaf, a tree, a flower, a grass, a little wood, a stone, you know, all these objects. What, what shall I do with that? 
And then he wrote her, I look at nature with tenderness, with pure empathy, with love. And I wish so much that you could see nature with my eyes. I must say, I was invited to South Africa in the year and exactly in the time. You know, it was booked one year before, no one knew. And it was then when I came first to Africa, it was South Africa, I arrived in that time when the inauguration of Nelson Mandela was celebrated. And the whole country was in a total other fashion. No criminality in these days, a huge joy. And I also was watching, of course, TV and there was in the, at the place where he then appeared. And one really felt one is part of a historical event. And this was the foundation of my love for Africa. I felt such a good mood and being down in the south, so I imagined a bit the whole continent from this point, Cape Town, Johannesburg. I imagined up to Morocco and the Mediterranean Sea, Egypt, and I thought, what spirit in future can help this continent to find its mission in the global family? Because me as a European, you cannot imagine how I suffered when I learned in school all this colonialism, this robbing mentality, this land grabbing. And now in modern times, how China, Russia, America are just, you know, buying and poisoning the land. It's for me, if I would not have anthroposophy, you know, I, I couldn't cope. Yeah, anthroposophy really helped me to cope even with very bad and sad things and try to, yeah, to see and to teach that the evil is in the world in order to wake up for the good. Yeah, without this perspective, I would not be able. So this event started my love for this continent. And therefore, when I was invited by Julia to, in, again in South Africa, to do the international postgraduate medical training, I was happy to come back. And when then this transformation came to the AAT and to these Eastern African countries, I was very happy to get to know more and more. And I'm curious how long I will live and how many countries I will be able to get to know. So I was very impressed about your institution here. And what impressed me most, you know, you are in Africa. And the mentality is not when I say we meet at 12, then people are there at 12. It's then more or less 12, yeah. And when we planned here and talked with Judy and said, out of our experiences with previous IPMTs, uh, AATs, when we then said, Judy, do you think that the meals will be on time? She did not say, yes, of course. She said, we will try to do our best but that it is so punctually in the early morning, you know, whenever it's lunch or dinner time, dinner is there. So this is something extremely helpful for our work because we could count, we were sure, we could use the time between the meals for our work. There was no fear, there was no improvisation necessary. You know, in, in another place we were, then the host had booked 
the main hall in which you wanted to do your rhythmy for a band and there was all of a sudden loud music so we had to go then with the Eurythmy outdoor and find a place you know it's not not a problem to improvise but when you ask me what was special here then it was this punctuality this peacefulness this extreme friendliness one really feels at home here yeah and then of course the beautiful coast and for our nature study, the plant environment, I would say it was ideal. And I love Turkey as well. I said already that when I married, my husband and myself, we had only a weekend for a wedding travel. Yeah? And we traveled to Istanbul and to Ellipsis. Yeah, for me, the AAT, has three aspects which make me quite excited. One is to meet really engaged African people from different countries, not with their local egoism for my organization, for my country, I need this and no, they come here looking over their own belongings. Yeah, and they to network, they get to know, they exchange experiences, this marketplace for example. They work together in the small groups, they become friends. So to contribute to globalism and not to nationalism, this is one. Second, that independent of the preconditions, the people here are able to enter in this sort of anthroposophic basic studies we are doing here. Yeah, that they really do the observation exercises, that they participate in Eurythmy and some moving really gifted. Yeah? So there is a certain human pre-qualification which has access to what we do. And also the understanding is astonishing good. So that is what I like and that they understand that the AAT is not an organization, has no boss. It's a free initiative from Africans for Africans, inclusive the struggle how to get the finances together. So it's all self-made out of such a core group which takes them the responsibility and now at the end of this week, will be formed a new preparation group for the next one. And there are two countries who would like to have it. One is Botswana, one is Namibia. And now we need to look who is next, who is maybe over next. Yeah, so it's a free initiative. And that is what I like because it qualifies people to become self-active. And that is what I think the future needs clear thinking, self-active, initiative people who do not just follow the mainstream and always say, oh, I can do nothing. Yeah, we can do a lot, but we need to become active. I thank you for your interest and I'm really very glad to have met this institution and organization and its people.